Well, Razorback fans, we know that it is a big game coming up against Mississippi State, a must win, if you will. But what are some of the things that Arkansas specifically needs to work on this week in practice? Let's talk about it on today's Locked On Razorbacks podcast, THV 11 Tuesday edition. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors, and I am joined alongside a very special guest here, just like every Tuesday or Saturday or whenever we decide to do it. It is Tyler Cast, the sports director of THV 11 down there in central Arkansas. And Tyler, as always, man, appreciate you joining us. How you doing? Happy to be here. And, uh, yeah, I, I was doing a little bit better, I think, Saturday morning than I am now as far as my general hopefulness went, but otherwise, great. Well, I mean, this, I think a lot of Razorback fans can relate to that. So uh, before we kind of get into this week, I want your thoughts on what happened. Like, I know that it was going to be a tough game to win, and I'm not saying that Arkansas should have won or uh, was even favored to win, but I don't think anybody was expecting a 24-point beatdown on your home turf, especially there at night in Fayetteville in front of the fourth largest crowd in Razorback Stadium history. Yeah, like, I mean... You named a bunch of things there that were aligned to make it seem like this exact uh, thing could not happen. And worse Arkansas teams than this have played much better games against better LSU teams than this. I mean, I don't think LSU did anything special. Arkansas just they, they felt just timid all around to begin with, which feels weird coming off the the biggest win of you know at least this coaching staff's time in Arkansas a bye week to get people healthy two weeks to prepare defensively and it seemed like their their best plan of attack with two weeks to repair was oh gosh let's not get beat overhead for a 50 yard touchdown and keep everything in front of us and and then as soon as LSU gave them an opportunity to kind of just roll over and go away Arkansas took it because I mean yeah they were in that game I think and, until that kind of brutal interception right by the goal line. And after that, you just didn't see any fight in them. So, yeah, I mean, LSU, like, before that, gave them chance after chance to kind of stay right there with it. But Arkansas just didn't seem interested in it. And it's frustrating, I think, especially because I think we said after that Tennessee game, all right, the second half of that Tennessee game, we saw a lot of things out of Arkansas that we have not seen under Sam Pittman. We saw them at home fight back from some adversity, finish off a win and kind of show that they are capable of that. And then LSU was supposed to be the prove it game. All right, you're capable, but is this who, you, what your identity is? And I think, I mean, if anything we learn, no, that's more of a surprising thing that can happen occasionally, but it's not who this team is, which is disappointing. Yeah. And I think also uh, just knowing that any momentum that they had coming out of the bye week, uh, that's not the type of performance that's going to give Razorback fans much confidence this week against Mississippi State, which Mississippi State's not a good football team. I mean, they've only won one game this season, and defensively, they're, they're the worst in the SEC, and offensive, they've been proved. But doesn't it seem kind of like maybe Arkansas, I don't want to say that they're uh, in jeopardy of losing it, but you certainly don't feel as confident as you did before. Is this a game that Arkansas should walk in and win handedly, or is Mississippi State going to cause them some problems? Well, I mean, you know, there's that word should again. Yeah, Arkansas should walk in and beat this Mississippi State team by three touchdowns at least. They they are bad. You mentioned the offensively getting a little better. Probably gave A&M more of a run for their money than the Aggies want. Um, but some of that's just the SEC this year. I mean, it's, you know, a little circle of, de of defeat or victory, depending on who you root for. Um, but no, I mean, look, this – and that's the thing too. If Arkansas had lost a close game against LSU – I, you're still feeling fine because, look, that's a top 10 LSU team. Uh, and you go into this week thinking, all right, now they're angry. They're going to take that on Mississippi State. And that's still how it should be. I mean, this should be, at this point, an angry Arkansas team looking to prove, hey, that wasn't us on Saturday. Um, but we've, kind of, we've seen portions of that in, in all three losses this year that maybe that is them. So it, this one, I think, really kind of comes down to – the big thing that Sam Pittman emphasized this off season, which was the locker room is in a much better place mentally. It's a more co cohesive unit. They're together. They have something to prove. Uh, this is the ultimate one. Cause if you go out and I mean, Arkansas could play, you know, pretty poorly and still win this game. You're still not feeling great the rest of the season. I mean, Arkansas could easily win two more games, Mississippi state, and Louisiana tech probably, and you still don't feel good about it. So I think for everyone's sake, Arkansas needs to go out there 
uh, angry and win by three scores, four scores. I mean, yeah, anything, a blowout is what will make me happy. So what do you think that is the key to that this week as far as improving? Because it's not like you're in fall camp and you're just continuing to develop, but uh, getting this team ready for that game on the road, it's an early one there in Starkville, and it's a place that uh, Sam Pittman's first win as a Razorback head coach uh, started back in 2020. But now it's a, a totally different deal. But uh, what do you ex what do you think they need to work on the most just in practice that can help them uh, against a team like Mississippi State? Uh, piping in the cowbells, I'm sure. I mean, even in a, in a bad year, those things will still be ringing. You can only bring the volume down on highlights so much, I've learned over the years. Um, but other than that, I mean, you know, you try to respect everyone in the SEC, and I'm sure that that you know Sam drills that into people. But as far as just quality of opponent goes, this year's Mississippi State team feels like a non-conference game. This feels like a UAB or a Louisiana Tech where, sure, you're doing a little bit of work on you know specific opponent stuff, but the focus is on Arkansas. And I think that could be a good thing. Coming off a loss like this where, hey, the opponent is nameless and faceless and, yeah, we're on the road, but whatever, uh, what, what can Arkansas do to, to kind of reclaim – you know, what we did against Tennessee or what, what, what we did in successful weeks before that. Uh, you kind of, you know, again, no disrespect, but some disrespect to Mississippi State. You, you throw out the opponent this week and, and focus internally. Well, we'll talk a little bit about uh, not only what Arkansas needs to do, but also uh, what's been the problem and how they haven't been able to get in the end zone very often when getting into the red zone. We'll do that here in a second. So stay with us here on Locked On Razorbacks podcast. All right, folks, I got to tell you about our friends, of course, over at Roy. I know all you Razorback fans, it's all about that player of the week. So far this season, we have pooled $20,000 to support players on Roy. Micro deposits lead to massive change. And with the Roy app, you can direct your support to the athletes that you love and ensuring that all funds go to the specific player that you choose. Unlike collectives, you know exactly where your support is going and you receive exclusive content like personal videos, updates after the season, a lot of good stuff like that. And the best part is it's risk free. If the transfer, if athlete transfers or if it doesn't deliver on the content or anything like that, you get your money back guaranteed. And this week, I'm supporting Devin Bale, the punter. He needs some love. The number one punter in the SEC, consistent, doing his job. I just pitched in $100 and I'd love for you to join me. Even $10 makes a difference. Let's show Devin Bale the love and keep him connected to our school here at Arkansas. Remember, pay today, celebrate tomorrow. Your support sets up your team for success. Plus, don't miss out on Roy's exciting giveaway. Win two tickets to a game in November. Just download Roy, create an account, and enter in referral code Locked On, and you're entered. Already on Roy? Any contribution to an athlete's campaign also gets you entered automatically. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited. Download Roy now and join the NIL game with no subscriptions and no fees. And be sure to check them out on Instagram, Facebook, and X at Roy underscore. Return on you for more info. Roy, support the players and change the game. All right, so continuing on our discussion here on the Locked on Razorbacks podcast, THB 11, Tuesday edition of it. Tyler Cass, sports director of THB 11, joining us. So, Tyler, it's it's weird to see where Bobby Petrino, as the offensive coordinator coming in, everyone was really excited, and rightfully so. And it looked like in the beginning, you had a really good rushing attack, which is going to Jackson. Uh, you had uh, some things going in the passing game, Taylor Green with not only his arm, but with his legs. There were some things to really be positive about, but it seems like since that point in time, it's just not there. The explosive plays aren't there. Uh, the big-time playmaking ability has not been there. And they're dead last in the SEC when they get into the red zone of scoring. Now, they didn't get to the red zone at all against LSU, so it doesn't change that stat. But what do you think has been the issue, or at least the biggest issue, as to why Arkansas can have production, get yards, get into the territory of their opponent, but come away with no points from it. I mean, look, the red zone offense is, you know, a different beast. Every team deals with that. It's tougher when the field gets shorter. Um, I think some of it is just a guy whose name you said, Jaquindon Jackson, because in those first couple of weeks, he was unstoppable in the red zone. I mean, this, this man was doing things we haven't seen Razorback backs do in 10 years, 15 years or so. And then the numbers, we're looking video game esque, and for whatever reason, they've gone away from that. I don't know if it's just, you know, I mean, some of it obviously the SEC defenses get better, uh, and Jaquindon has a tendency to get banged up uh, in pretty much every game he's in, so the availability is not there as much. 
but I mean, just any way to get him space seemed like it was working and they kind of went away from him and heck they went away from the running game almost entirely. It felt like against LSU uh, much to their detriment. The other thing I think um, it's kind of been a season long outside the red zone deal as well, but it really hurts them in the red zone is they have not been able to get the tight ends involved at all. I think we came into this year thinking that's a good group, especially Luke Haas at the top. And I know he's been dealing, I think it was a back issue for a lot of the season, just kind of different. But I mean, with Washington, with Barky's gums, I mean, tight ends, it's, it's almost a cliche in football to say, hey, they, they become super valuable in the red zone. But that's because it, it, it just works. It, the, the kind of routes you can run with a tight end, the kind of things you can do, the kind of things Bobby Petrino knows how to do, um, work a lot better in short yardage. And I think it's a bigger issue about not getting the tight end passing game going at all much this year. But if they had an inkling of that in the red zone, that would be a lot better. But I mean, cause there's so many things that point to, it should be a strength for this team. It's where you can run, you know, some kind of pass option plays with Taylor green and exploit his legs. You've got a running back who's capable. You've got tight ends who we thought were capable. We just haven't seen it as much, but yeah, I mean, feed your Quinn didn't feed the tight ends and it feels like the red zone issues should get better. Well, and I think that's the thing about this this team is that uh, offensively, at least, you know, there's been times where, as you said, the, the tight ends felt like it would be an easy thing. And I still think there's talent there, but they just ha- haven't had any production from it. And there's been times where the running backs look really great, and then there's times that they don't. There's times that the offensive line looked very much improved. There's times they didn't. There's times that Taylor Green looked like he's the dude, and there's times he didn't. It's just, it seems like they can never get all of the positions just on the same page and, and to be good at the same time. And that's where it's like, I, I don't know if the, I think that the rushing attack is the strength of a team, but I don't know. Uh, I think that the athleticism of Taylor green is a very dangerous thing, but I don't know, you know, you just haven't seen enough from it. And here we are through seven games. And it's just a weird thing to think like, there's so much about this team. We don't know, or at least we can't count on or predict because there's no consistency in really any aspect, especially these specific position groups. Yeah, so a lot of that comes down to coaching for me. I mean, the to generalize what you said there, it's it's identity. We don't know what this team's offensive identity is, and that is something you want set by the coaching staff. And I, I know it's a lot tougher in 2024. I mean, Arkansas had a new offensive coordinator in Bobby Petrino, so that's already setting you back a little bit with familiarity. And then – you know, he didn't know what his roster was going to look like until week one, probably from a full, you know, standpoint. And then they've had guys in and out with injuries and whatnot. But that's something you want established in camp. Hey, this is what we're best at. This is what we're going to do. And at very least to, to open a game until we have to make an adjustment. This is what teams are going to have to deal with. And, yeah, like you said, we've seen flashes. We've seen the games where the running attack is just clicking and they just keep going there. Games where, all right, we can kind of set Taylor loose and let him go to work. Um, but every time it feels like something is working, they almost go away from it. Uh, again, I don't know if they're scared of, oh, the other team's figuring out we have to adjust or, you know, Quinn and Jackson leaves the game with an injury. Luke Haas is up hobbling on, off his back. Talon maybe still not 100% in the bone bruise, but and an offensive line that, yeah, has dealt with injuries, guys shifting around positions. But I think there's just a failure to establish an identity uh, despite – some seemingly obvious ones with this team, but I mean, if it's obvious to us, it's obvious to the rest of the SEC. So maybe they're just getting in their own heads, trying to trick people. Maybe so. And I think that that's, what's kind of uh nerve wracking is just the, the inconsistencies, but also the the optimism. Cause there is some things that you see that's give you reasons to be optimistic. I think one of them is Braylon Russell, where after that game against Tennessee felt like, okay, maybe, maybe he's going to get it going and didn't really have any, any action. I mean, I think he had three carries against tennis at LSU. And then you have Sam Pittman saying earlier this week where he's like, Hey, we, we want to feed him, we feed him, feed him the ball. So sounds like that they're going to, but you think with the Jaquin and Jackson thing is, is Braylon Russell. Does he need to be the feature back? Does he need to be the guy that uh, gets uh, let the, let the horse eat or whatever that is that Sam Pittman said? Yeah. I mean, and the thing with the Sam saying that it almost felt like is he, kind of hinting to to Bobby and the offensive staff is like, hey, I wanted to see more of this and I didn't. Um, and then as far as Braylon and Jaquindon goes, again, with Jaquindon having, you know, he's had all kinds of cramping issues this year. I think Sam said, put him down as probable in his press conference. But in a world where Jaquindon is your kind of, your, your speed guy, your big chunk guy, 
yeah, sure, throw Braylon Russell out there as as the workhorse, the guy who can take a beating because he is massive, especially by running back standards, uh, and can get you north south. I mean, you, you talk about always following forward. That's what Braylon Russell does. Guys hit him, he's got another two yards just because he, he falls forward. So. Yeah, especially against Mississippi State, where Arkansas really should be able to just kind of assert their will at the line of scrimmage and and let Braylon Russell go to work. And then you need a speed guy, you need a, a chunk guy, you bring in Jaquindon Jackson. But also, if there is ever a week to try and let him heal a bit more uh, before the, the final part of this schedule, this is probably that week, uh, you know, non bye week version. But yeah, I mean... Heck, we, we, we'd all love to see more of Braylon, I think, as a featured guy. Because, again, it's the same thing, that we've seen those flashes. We don't know what feature back Braylon Russell looks like. Maybe he's not a guy who can handle 20 carries a game. But I'd, I'd like to find out. And if there's a game this point, this late in the season, you shouldn't still be testing stuff out. But if there's an SEC game to do it, it's, what, one in five, bottom of every defensive category in Mississippi State. Well, before you get out of here, Tyler, what, what's all going on at THB 11? What do you got to, going on for – this week, as well as the coverage of all things Razorbacks there with THB. Yeah, uh, high, high school football Friday nights is uh, where it all starts. Uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, depending on the week of, of highlights, every Friday night at 10 on the Blitz, Hog Zone, breaking things down post-game, no matter the, the, the time of the game, 10-10 on THB 11 uh, Saturday night. We are there breaking down uh, the Razorback game that just ended or is still going on in, in some cases is the fun. And then uh, this week in Little Rock, we've got the first ever uh, PGA Champions Tour event in the entire state of Arkansas being played at Little Rock this week. So it's a bunch of guys uh, who, if you paid attention to golf 15, 20 years ago, you're like, oh yeah, Ernie Els, VJ Singh. Uh, they're, they're, they're names that golf people know. And uh, that's that's coming to Little Rock this week. And uh, we're going to be all over that. So I, I know there's a bunch of people at the station actually who are big, big into golf. The golf people are excited. The course looks great. I wish I could play in the Pro-Am, but I, I didn't get my name in in time. Well, there's always next year, man. There's always next year for it. So, But, hey, we appreciate it. It's Tyler Cass, the sports director of THV 11. This has been a THV 11 Tuesday here on the Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Appreciate each and every one of you listening in and watching in. For Tyler Cass, I'm John Neighbors, same sports podcast, same sports channel. Tomorrow here on Locked on Razorbacks. Have a great rest of your night, everybody. We'll see you then.